everyone, and thanks for tuning in to Beats Research Radio, a podcast and YouTube channel that aims to disseminate science and research the community. My name is Nicole Chu, an undergraduate student at the University of Ottawa, and I'll be your host on today's episode. Joining us is Dr. Connor Kupchak, an assistant professor at Carleton University in the Department of Electronics. Dr. Kupchak leads the Carleton University Quantum Information Technology Laboratory. The main research focuses of their team include the development of light-based quantum communication technologies for applications in the future quantum internet. Dr. Kupchak is also involved in many Indigenous outreach and engagement initiatives. He currently serves as the Indigenous Mentorship Program Manager for Let's Talk Science at the University of Ottawa and Carleton University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kupchak. Thank you for having me. To begin our interview, how would you explain quantum optics to someone completely unfamiliar to your field? Great, great. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that could be a very uh, long-winded and, you know, um, complicated question. But I think, you know, most at the most basic level, quanti- uh, quantum optics is the quantization of light and electromagnetic field. And so basically what this means when we say quantization, it means that we're like saying taking, you know, light and breaking it down to its small and smaller constituents. Basically, you know, imagine we have the light that we see and we keep attenuating, attenuating, attenuating to small and smaller amounts until we can't attenuate anymore. And so that limit is what we call like the quanta of light. And so specifically for light, we kind of refer, we refer to this as photons. It has its own special name for a single quanta of light. And then quantum optics as the field where it's being doing research is the study of these photons uh very very few number of photons and how it interacts with very with matter and very few amount of atoms and so as you can imagine single particles of light are very fragile because if we have like say a laser pointer and we shine it at the wall those photons then become destroyed and are no longer useful so you could just think that you know if you capture a photon with your eye you know you register that in your brain like that is no longer useful so these photons are very fragile. So if we want to actually use them um, for, you know, interesting and advanced applications, we need very complex devices and very elegant t- techniques in order to study them. And so what's really neat about quantum optics is that even very recently, it was at the core of the most recent uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, Physics, the 2022 Nobel Prize. And this was awarded for the demonstration of quantum entanglement using photons. And so a bit about quantum entanglement, you could probably get like a hundred different explanations for what it is. And of course I have my own explanation, that's what I'm gonna give. But it's a phenomenon where occurs where you have two entities, and two entities just means two things, and they're you know physically separated. They have some sort of way that you could um, you know disattach one from the other. But despite that, and they exhibit quantum effects, but they're even though they're, you know, physically separated or somehow different systems, they are actually inherently tied to each other, right? They have some sort of inherent underneath underlying connection. And so what this means is that when we, what happens to one of these entities, or in this case, let's say photons, what happens to one photon immediately has an impact on what happens to the other photon, even though they are, could be very far apart from each other. So this is kind of what Einstein, his famous quote was saying, this is what spooky action at a distance. And so, true. And so, like, kind of in short form, it's like say that you have, uh, you know, well, it could be two photons, but say one is red and one is blue. If you send the red one, you send one in one direction, and the other in the other direction. If one says, "Oh, I have the red photon," they immediately know the other one's blue. And so, someone might say, "Well, how do you know the photons just didn't like decide? You know, they were going to be red and blue beforehand." And, uh, you know, and, and we're just kind of, you know, confirming that's the case. And basically proving that it was truly unknown which was red and which was blue until the measurement was made took many decades of research. Well, thank you so much for the explanation on photon entanglement. I really enjoyed the analogy of the colors. So now that we've gone through like a very brief overview of what quantum optics is, I was wondering how it's currently being applied in development of communication technologies and for information processing. Yeah, great. So, you know, that that was a very um, profound uh, discovery and, you know, proof and a lot of bo- big body work. But now it says, OK, well, that that's neat. It's, you know, something inherent to the universe. But how do we actually use it? How do we actually apply it? You know, how do we kind of, you know, better the world around us? And so there's many applications of quantum optics. They range from computing, sensing, measurement, networking. But one of the most sought after and kind of most immediate is its promise for fully secure communications. 
And so light and then photons by you know association make a great choice for communications because they don't interact well with the environment. Um, you know, meaning they don't, they're not um what photon travels through there, it's easily destroyed, but it, you know, it's its state is not easily altered by the things around it, other than it being lost. Um, and of course it travels at light speeds. And so you could actually get 100 percent um guaranteed communication security by using photons for what is known as quantum photography or kind of the more immediate app, um, design would be what's called quantum key distribution. And so quantum key distribution, you know, I'm trying to limit the, the jargon right a bit, right? But it's like, it's essentially one day going to replace our current encryption techniques. And so right now our encryption, the way that when we send information over the internet, it's done by essentially taking two very large numbers and large binary numbers and multiplying them together. And then so basically doing that reverse operation of getting that factor uh, becomes a very complex problem. And that's how we, we basically use that, that multiplication number as our encryption key. Now, this is safe and secure in our present society, but it could now become compromised to say hackers as computational power and computers become more advanced. So QKD is a number as a way to circumvent this, of course. So there's many people have interest in this in terms of like um, you know finance and military, of course, to to come up with this 100% secure encryption. And so while QKD has a number of its own like aspects in itself, a way to enhance uh, you know to use QKD to enhance security is to ex actually leverage this quantum entanglement. And that we do this is that we say, okay, if we have the red and blue photons, let's say we assign the red to be a zero and the blue to be a one. And so that way we could send, you know, up all these pairs of the entangled photons. So send the zeros and ones to two different parties. And then in this way, when one party receives, say there's zero, they know the other party automatically received a one. And what happens is that if they then take that long, so if they do this, you know, many, many times, and they have this big, basically now they have a, a, a string of zeros and ones, if they then go later and basically share a small piece of it and say, do we get the right match between the zeros and ones? Because I know what I got, you know what you got. If there's any discrepancy there, then they know that in fact, this key was intercepted at some point and it has been compromised. And so they know that the security has been broken. So that key is no longer being used. Oh, I see. With like all of our communication online these days, it's really cool to see how photon entanglement is being used to improve like data security and encryption. So um, switching gears sort of to more of your research, can you please share with us more about the past research projects you have engaged in and explored? Yes, of course. Yeah. So I've, I've actually, so I've been in the field for 15 years. I've been lucky enough to work on many different projects. Uh, so I, I don't know if I could talk about all of them. But one of the ones that I've been lucky enough to work on is the development of an optical quantum memory device. And so this, this is kind of like a very long term, but it, it actually is kind of amazing when you look at face value. It's basically like a, a machine, you know, a device or a component that's capable of capturing, storing, and then releasing photons that are encoded with information on demand. And basically, say, it could capture and release entangled photons. So as I mentioned, it face value this sounds very weird because you have a device that's already capable of stopping and holding on to light. And then more so, you're able to then have the power to then say, okay, but now I want the light to be released, right? And as everyone probably knows, is light doesn't like to stay put. It travels at the speed of light. So it's really neat to have a setup in your lab that's capable of doing such this operation. Um, but what's what makes it even kind of more complicated is that like, having a device which can store light in itself isn't good enough for, for quantum applications. It actually needs to be able to store quantum information. Um, so what that means is that a quantum memory, a device capable of storing quantum information, can't actually make a measurement at it. It can't actually know what it has. So if you think about your laptop that we currently use, the memory inside stores your info as a strings of zeros and ones. So when you recall the information, it knows that it had a zero or one. It knows how to, you know, take take that information and pull it out. But the quantum memory itself must store a zero and a one, or a one, sorry, and not actually know which it is. Because if it knows which it is, then in the entanglement, if say that zero one was entangled with the, the opposite, that entanglement would be destroyed by the memory storing it. 
So a quantum memory has an additional restriction on it that it must be able to store, not know what it's storing, but in a in a, the most ideal sense, be able to say that something has been stored. So it's a very complex and you know um, intricate problem to be working on it. But so there's many applications of this, but the most immediate and why people are pursuing it is that if you had some device which was able to do this successfully, it would allow us to extend the communication distance of entangled photons. Oh, I see. Wow, that's really cool to see the many applications of quantum optics in data security, data storage. But uh, now that we've gone through some of these applications, what are the current challenges or barriers when we are developing these quantum-based technologies, such as these quantum communication networks, which you were just speaking about? Yeah, and, and so kind of like leading from that previous question is that one of the biggest obstacles for actually realizing this quantum optical network or, or what would be what we call the future quantum internet is overcoming the losses that light experiences as it propagates. So kind of the way that, so the way that it works right now is when we communicate through optics, so fiber optics, is that we send light that's been encoded with information through optical fibers. Now, when light goes through optical fibers, you could think of it as it's bouncing off the sides of the fiber. So it's going like, and so every time it makes that kind of reflection, internal internal reflection, we, we may get a little bit of loss. So as we, um, the further that we propagate, the less of that signal is going to be available to us. So the way that we get around this in, a, in our current communications environment is we have every now and then we have what we call a repeater station, which basically amplifies the light or regenerates it such that our signal is now reproduced and now could travel further. However, you can't take this same approach when doing the same with entangled photons at the quantum with, that carries quantum information, because what happens is that when you do this application, the information that's stored in it then becomes degraded. Um, so therefore, we need to come up with very complex intricate schemes to overcome this barrier. And so one of the, the long sought after goals that you know is kind of at the forefront of this research is to build what's known as an operational scalable economical quantum repeater, basically something which can extend the, inf extend the information distance, but likewise preserve the, the quantum properties we're interested in preserving. And another you know tie to that, right? Another big problem that comes with this is that when we're making these, these quantum repeaters is that we have all these, they're made of different components. And these components, we need to have them to actually talk to each other, which which on you know one hand say, like, why, why is that? What do you mean talk to each other? Like what happens? But kind of one of the problems I deal with, right, is that like you have a quantum memory and it's able to use its atoms to to actually capture the light, but those but those atoms only capture light of a certain color. So they capture red photons, for instance. But our current communications network has light that takes light at infrared. So basically we have a, you know, we have a mismatch there, right? We have red photons for memory and infrared light for the fiber. So therefore we need to build an additional device which can successfully convert the red light to an infrared light. Oh, I see. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Kruchak, for shedding just like a little bit of light on yeah. the applications of quantum optics and photon entanglement. I'm sure it was like definitely very enlightening for all of our audience members too. Mm -hmm. And Great. thank you so much for Beats Research Radio listeners for your time and for Dr. Kupchak for your time as well on our channel. Wishing everyone good health. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.